he had a lot of reasons to die. He, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and he had essentially like a, in all likelihood, a male lover for his entire campaign, which I assume back then was that that was frowned upon, so that was kept quiet. Alexander didn't leave any heirs. Right? Well, he did. But he, it was an infant, an unborn son mm. was left behind him, and his uh, his wife from Afghanistan, Roxana. Uh, he also had other concubines, but only one one as yet unborn son. Uh, and both the son and his wife were eliminated pretty quickly by one of his former generals. They were assassinated. I was going to say also, I, I don't know how much racial politics plays in at the time, but like he was marrying someone who wasn't from like Macedonia or something mm -hmm. like that. They're from outside. Was that? an issue in in politically probably the old guard resented it there is yeah. thought that they did you know they would prefer he had married into one of their families one of the macedonian noble women it wasn't so much racial as it was you know cultural right, they, right, they, right. they just weren't greeks right. uh, and macedonians thought of themselves as being greek even though the greeks themselves thought that they were you know weird greeks you know greeks on the fringes of things yeah um but uh yeah so alexander is so fascinating because his afterlife is as rich and diverse as his actual incredibly eventful life. Yeah. You know, uh, he just uh, defines what a king and conqueror can do for the rest of classical civilization. How did he die again? Probably malaria. He may have been poisoned. It's a whole, there's various conspiracy theories. He oh, dies. Let's get into them. Yeah, yeah. So he, the center of his empire was Babylon. He had decided to kind of, he established himself there in, a, in the spring of 323 BC. And it was planning his campaigns um, off towards Arabia and the West. Um, when uh, his best friend and possible lover, Hephaestion, falls ill, um, he mourns him. And at this point, he's already in pretty bad health. He'd had taken an arrow to the chest in India, um, you know, that this vicious barbed arrow went right through his ribs um, and uh, had caused a hemorrhage. He'd almost died. And he'd managed to survive that, but was always kind of sickly thereafter. He was an alcoholic. Um, a really bad alcoholic towards the end, especially. That also weakened his constitution. And uh, at one point in, in the spring, or late spring, he goes off to the marshes around Babylon and probably gets malaria there. Mm. Um, and so he gets a fever. He falls more and more sick. His doctors can't do anything. And finally, he, he dies um, from some combination of advanced alcoholism, his former injuries and malaria is the usual guess. This, the conspiracy theory was um, that some of his generals had inspired with Aristotle to concoct this uh, crazy potion from Styx water. I kid you not. You know, the, the river, like the, under the river Styx? Like in the underworld, right. There was a spring in Southern Greece that was supposed to flow with the water of the Styx. It was this like black, very cold water. It was supposed to be deadly to any creature. So the idea was that they'd gotten some of the Styx water with Aristotle's help and put it in the hoof of a mule, because no other container could, can, could would, any container would dissolve under the Styx water, and brought that all the way to Babylon, where they put into his wine, and they had killed off Alexander. Um, that where probably, does that theory come from? Uh, it's hard to say, really. I mean, probably from court gossip right afterward. People wanted him dead, um, but I think it's much more likely that his many physical infirmities just caught up with him. Yeah, and he was, all, as you said, like he had... He had a lot of reasons to die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he had essentially like a, in all likelihood, a male lover for his entire campaign, which I assume back then was that that was frowned upon, so that was kept quiet? No, I mean, he would have been a little old for it. It's one of these things where what we call Greek pederasty, I mean, boy loving, um, it's one of the most uncomfortable aspects of classical civilization. And it's kind of confined to certain age ranges and certain elements of society. But it's usually an aristocratic guy in his 20s, early 30s, and a teenage boy. It's kind of the coupling that's accepted. But if you're much older than that uh, on either side, then it seems kind of unmanly. So it's it's a weird thing that's acceptable in certain scenarios, but not otherwise. But we don't know uh, what Hephaestion was to him, if he was just a friend or something more. That's kind of just later hypothesizing. In the Alexander movie, I don't know if you saw that. This is the Oliver Stone one. From, I did not see that. It's not great. Um, so I wouldn't waste did your time. Did I see that? Um, was that Colin Farrell? Yeah. yeah that I one. did see that. You did, yeah. yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, there are parts of that that are pretty good. Um, parts, many other parts not. Uh, but um, there they kind of make it clear they think it's a romantic thing. But we don't know that. We don't even know that in the Iliad, like uh, Achilles and Patroclus, which is kind of where this dynamic comes from, mm. if, they, if that's romantic either, that might just be, you know, a, a more platonic thing. But anyway... For, for Alexander, in any case, um, 
he was controversial to his men, but because he became more and more Persian, um, he began to insist that they bow to him like a Persian king, like to a Persian he king. He became more Persian? In, in his mannerisms. So before, you know, a, a Macedonian king was kind of a first among equals. Like among his his nobles, his aristocrats, they kind of was, they were pals, you know, they, they hunted together, they would go to the baths together. But a Persian king was elevated above anybody else. And Alexander began to adopt the style, the costume, uh, all of the courtly ritual of the Persian court that he had conquered. So he began to insist that they, they, they do uh, proskinesis, it was called, that they have to like, uh, make obeisance to him, you know, go bow on the floor. And uh, they didn't like that very oh, much. Oh, he was power tripping. Exactly. He was power I mean, he thought he was the son of a god. So this is probably a pretty yeah, small step for him. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, that'll help. Um, so it was probably, he became foreign to them by adopting these customs from Eastern kingship. Um, less so other things he did. Yeah, it seems like because he had so little time to conquer so much area, it, his focus his entire life was mm -hmm. the military. But did, yeah. did were there... Did he bring customs with him from Macedonia in the sense that, let me be more specific, mm -hmm. you know, there is Macedonian or Greek inspired architecture coming up in his wake as he leaves places mm -hmm. because his guys come in and they build things. Was there any, were, were there cultures and customs that were passed on as a result of the hurricane that he was? Absolutely there was. Um, so you know, even though he he's a kind of a, a comet, you know, he's gone very quickly. But after his death, um, much of Central Asia, you know, as far as Afghanistan, remains Greek for two centuries um, under his successors. Wow. And these guys bring Greek colonists and Greek customs deep into Asia. So there's a famous city called, or the modern name is Ai Hanum, in, um, on the border of Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, in the middle of the steppe, in the middle of nowhere. And this city, which was excavated before the, the Soviet-Afghan War, um, had was a Greek city in the middle of the Asian steppe. It had um, a gymnasium. It had a theater. It had, it had a temple of Zeus. They found the sayings of the Delphic Oracle engraved, um, you know, 4,000 miles from Delphi. Whoa. And so, Whoa. and for many centuries, even the, the Parthians, who are these um, Asian steppe nomads, essentially, who conquer um, most of Alexander's former empire in the second century BC, they used Greek as their administrative language for centuries. Um, and there are Greek cities in their domains that were established by Alexander and his successors. Um, Egypt becomes a Hellenized country. Uh, Greek is the second language of Egypt for a thousand years because of Alexander. Because he was He conquered, he conquered Egypt. Them, yeah, right? and part of the Persian Empire and then part of his. And after him, oh. um, the Ptolemies uh, will then make Egypt their kingdom. And they use Greek. So any, any ambitious Egyptian learns Greek for a thousand years because the Romans keep that language going. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here.